Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna wait just a few more seconds before getting started. Thank you all for being here today. And I'll kind of go ahead and lead us in. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and being with us today. Um, today, we are here for the Psychological Treatments for Headache Disorders, which we are hosting with the Society for Health Psychology, as well as co-sponsoring with Division 12, the Society of Clinical Psychology. My name is Dr. Danielle Myro. I'm the Virtual Programming Editor for the Society of Health Psychology. Um, before we begin, just a few items to share, um, as it should have popped up when we let you into the room that this event is being recorded. Anyone who speaks during it, such as asking a question, is agreeing to be recorded and granting permission for the recording to be posted on our website. And just as a friendly reminder, as some of the content will likely bring up clinical questions, personal experience, anecdotal experience, please be mindful um, that questions posted in the chat or questions asked are not um, disclosing PHI to maintain appropriate boundaries um, for ethical and HIPAA compliance. Again, if you have any questions, please um, post them in the chat. We will be waiting until the end of the presentation to address questions, so please know we'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, this webinar is available for two continuing education credits from the Society of Clinical Psychology with Division 12 sponsorship. The CE evaluation information will be sent directly to you via email shortly after the webinar. We'll be leaving the evaluation period open until about March 31st, and then after that, a CE certificate will be sent to you within five to 10 business days after the evaluation period closes. Even if you're not pursuing um, continuing education, we would love to get your feedback about the presentation. So please feel free to submit that even if not asking for CE. Um, and as I mentioned, we will be using questions at the end. Please put them in the chat or use your raise your hand feature and we'll help kind of guide the presenters. Um, so with that being ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters and I'll let Dr. Elizabeth Singh get us started. Great, can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see the slides? Great. Um, so I am um, Elizabeth Sang. I'm an associate professor in the Clinical Psychology Health Emphasis Program at Yeshiva University and a research associate professor in the Department of Neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, um, where I treat and conduct uh, clinical research studies in patients with headache disorders. Um, I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Ethan Benor, who's a clinical psychologist at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he's the center head for the Cleveland Clinic uh, Center for Pediatric Behavioral Health. He also directs outpatient services for the Center for Pediatric Chronic Pain and the Postdoc Fellowship in Pediatric Pain Psychology. So for those of you who are trainees and interns, you may be meeting Dr. Bonor at some point in the future. We're also joined by Noah Rosen, um, who is uh, a headache certified clinical neurologist. Um, he's the director of neurology residency at um, Northwell Health, and he's also an associate professor in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra in Northwell. Um, the three of us are also all members of the behavioral section of the American Headache Society, um, which is the organization where we originally developed the slide deck, but we have um, uh, uh, kind of modified it so that it's the most appropriate for um, Society for Health Psychology uh, today. So um, I want to very briefly go over our disclosures, um, the most important of which was that the presentation was produced with the support of American Headache Society. And then with that, I'm gonna uh, let uh, Noah Rosen take over. Great. Let me just uh, keep note of the time because uh, uh, after 25 years of doing this, I still uh, bubble over with enthusiasm, find it difficult to contain in any time given to me. So uh, I, I will be mindful of that. Um, so uh, it, my name is Noah Rosen. I am the uh, uh, residency director for neurology at Northwell Health, the Zucker School of Medicine uh, here on Long Island. Uh, and I am a board certified headache specialist and pain management specialist uh, in neurology, although I am also trained as a psychiatrist as well. Um, but I usually keep that under wraps. My wife is a uh, psychiatrist. She works uh, inpatient at Bellevue. So uh, uh, she reminds me uh, who the real psychiatrist in our family is. Um, but that being said, uh, 
you know, I'm really blessed with the opportunity to work in the field of headache medicine, uh, which is a great example of, of where all of these disciplines come together. So, you know, thank you for, for having me here uh, today to talk a little bit about the, uh, the medical ends of, of migraine and, and how that meshes well. So, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Seng uh, had left me with a blank slide at the beginning uh, of the section that said, why does a neurologist like to work with psychologists? And, uh, and I said, wow, you know, this, this, this is a tough slide to fill in. I mean, there's just so many different ways that this actually plays a role. And, you know, some of my research is in medical education, is in access to care. Um, and, uh, and so I said, well, let, let's, let's break this down to the simple one. And the first part is, uh, again, um, either diagnosing or addressing what's, what's, what's an obvious issue. And when somebody comes in with uh, uh, a crying, when they come in uh, anxious about their condition, many neurologists out there uh, pick this up. They just don't know exactly how to handle this. The, uh, I always say that by the time you reach for a scale, uh, you've already decided in your head that this, uh, this is an issue, but now you're trying to figure out what that issue is or quantify it or classify it. The, uh, the second part of that, uh, you know, again, is, is um, that many neurologists are not prepared, uh, either training-wise or time-wise, uh, to, to, to pull out the diagnosis or to address those, even if the, the issue may be obvious and, and, and oftentimes what drives somebody into subspecialized care, um, you know, they're not prepared to do that. And the, the second part of that, you know, let's, let's leave the obvious, I guess, behind and talk about the not so obvious. The, uh, when we leave um, uh, major uh, mood disorders or access one disorders or even access two disorders behind, when we start to talk about, you know, the way that people manage their conditions. And, you know, I'm always struck here where, where I practice uh, borders on to Queens and uh, Long Island Jewish Hospital is one of the most uh, uh, diverse places I've ever been. And, and it always amazes me that you can see the same condition and just in that cross and socioeconomic ways that, that everybody deals with their condition individually. So, you know, that, that not so obvious part, the, uh, not just the, the diagnosis, but um, the way that individuals manage those diagnoses, you know, is something that really falls beyond most neuro neurologists care. The, uh, and, and goes beyond just the simple um, uh, coming up with a code for the condition. Uh, the other part of this is really that, that our health system in general uh, focuses on, on pigeonholing uh, problems and uh, um, that oftentimes people that do rise to subspecialist care are because they, they have received parts of care in individual places and, you know, really one great thing of working with the health psychologist that I've been blessed to, and not just with Dr. Sang in her lab, and, uh, and, uh, Dr. Buse and uh, Dr. Gittleman in my own lab, but, you know, is, has been the opportunity, you know, really to provide overall care for someone who has headache disorders do cross over many different uh, health fields as well. And the last part of that is that community. I mean, the, uh, it, 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 we leave behind why this is so important. And when we talk about the well being, not just of our patient population, our trainees, but our own health force, you know, the, the interactions that we have uh, really help define, you know, the community and, and the support that we have for, for providers themselves. So, Betsy, can I have you go on to, to the next slide, which we're going to get into the meat of this condition. Now, I'm an adult neurologist and an adult psychiatrist, but um, many people will classify headache disorders as a pediatric condition. Um, and, and in part, that's because uh, um, migraine itself, uh, the peak prevalence of that is in the uh, teen years, the peak I'm sorry, the peak incidence is in the teen years. Uh, the peak prevalence is, is in the 40s. So when you look in, in the pediatric population, over half of kids will have actually experienced uh, headaches at, at some point. 
Um, so, you know, this is a familiarity that, that we have with this condition, even from a very young age. Um, you know, as a teacher, I can tell you that, um, that, that an, an entire book about Parkinson's disease or, or, or uh, you know, five lectures on the subject is not worth five minutes in the room with somebody that has Parkinson's. And, and the amazing thing about the prevalence of headache disorders and migraine disorders is that we all have that familiarity, um, you know, with, uh, if not in your own case, uh, in the family and close friends. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of recognition of, of the burden of this disease in that way. But what's less common is migraine disorder. And it really separates out because a lot of people out there still think of migraine as big head pain. And there's actually uh, a lot more complexity to it than that. But when we look in this pediatric age group, we see that already, um, you know, over 10% uh, of girls and 7.5% and of, of boys will have experienced a, a diagnosable migraine. So very few neurologic syndromes out there, uh, which come anywhere close to the prevalence in the, in the population to these, even at that, that young age. Chronic daily headache, what makes up the, the meat of most subspecialty centers in headache disorders. Uh, again, anywhere a prevalence from, from one and a half to three and a half percent of this population. So, so again, just uh, as you can see over the course of life here, um, actually, if you, uh, this is from Rich Lipton's data from, uh, from uh, uh, Montefiore, and he actually looked at people age 14 and above. If you project these numbers down into the younger age groups, uh, there's a point where actually uh, boys and girls are equal, if not the incidence in boys in the young teen years, slightly higher than that of girls. So once you hit menarche, um, that, that's where things start to change. Now, I'm not gonna say hormonal differences alone drive the differences, uh, between you know, boys and girls, or I should say at that point, men and women. Um, but uh, it is a very strong trigger. People identify that as uh, behind stress, probably the second most commonly identified trigger. So, you know, even if the hormonal change doesn't describe this difference, it has a, a, a significant impact uh, across population at this point. And, and you can see that, uh, that that peaks in prevalence in the 40s. Uh, the rates amongst women is about three times that of men in a one-year prevalence. Uh, it's about 18% of women, 6% of men. Um, the, uh, of course, over lifetime accumulation that, that, that remains consistent as well. Um, so again, just as I was saying, and, and we see the numbers actually stop at a certain age, but unfortunately, I see people up to any age I think I only have one person over a uh, hundred that's in my uh, in my practice, but um, the numbers go down, but they don't disappear entirely. Uh, about twelve percent of Americans have migraine. That's somewhere around forty-six million Americans. Uh, that's one in four households. Again, the, the very interesting the difference between uh, women and and men, and we could spend a whole lecture just talking about why that's the case. Um, the, uh, and, and that's actually true for most headache disorders, except uh, cluster and some of the autonomic cephalgias I'll touch on in just a moment. Um, actually, migraine is not the most common headache disorder. Tension type headache is somewhere around 40% of the population will have had a, a tension type headache within the last year. Uh, over 94% of the population will have had a headache period. Um, so chronic tension type headache, that is uh, more than 15 days a month, we would call chronic daily headache. That is more often than not. Uh, most of these are probably chronic migraine in their origin, uh, but chronic tension type headache, uh, much less frequent. Now, we don't see so much tension headache in offices because people generally treat these fairly easily with time, with anti-inflammatories, other somatic uh, um, uh, treatments, uh, although that's not always the case, but migraine by far the most common severe headache that makes it to medical care. Uh, cluster headaches, a different uh, story. This is a really uh, terrible headache, sometimes termed suicide headache. Um, not to say that any headache is good, but 
uh, what's interesting in this case is uh, not only do a lot of cluster sufferers use a scale from zero to 10, uh, they use a scale that has 10 subdegrees of 10 to try to capture that off the, the scale pain. Um, and it's interesting since migraine itself rates on scales with dental pain, childbirth, kidney stones. Um, so how could this be so much worse? In part, it's because it's not just an activation of the trigeminal vascular system that is a transmission of pain, but uh, these patients also have autonomic activation. They have uh, both activation of sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Uh, and part of that sympathetic uh, activation, rather than migraine sufferer wants to lie down in a dark, quiet room, uh, they tend to pace, to rock, to hit their head. So there's an activation of this agitation which, which combined with the underlying pain uh, makes for, for a truly different experience than the migraine sufferer wants to lie there in the dark and maybe with a bucket by the side of the bed. Uh, another common issue we deal with, again, post-traumatic headache. Um, the uh, post-traumatic headache can occur in 90% in, uh, of people who've had a traumatic brain injury, mild to moderate traumatic brain injuries, and persists. Uh, in, in a quarter of people who've initially had uh, post-traumatic headache. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, reasons that that may persist. Actually, Dr. Sen has written fairly extensively on that as well uh, um, about uh, the, the roles that trauma may play. But again, quite a significant aspect, particularly in, in a veteran's population. The next slide. All right. So I've talked a little bit about migraine. Uh, uh, let me just give you the international headache classification diagnosis. Um, so uh, this is a lot like uh, um, uh, the old menus, two from column A, one from column B. Uh, so you need at least uh, three events that meet this. And uh, some people meet that in a week. Some people uh, uh, can, can have that over years to, to develop it. But more often, it's a very stereotyped progression, lasting anywhere from one to 72 hours, usually around four uh, hours. Actually, if it's over 72 hours, we use the term status micronosis. And like I said, two from column A, one from column B. So column A is one-sided. That's actually where the word migraine came from, hemicrania or half of the head. Um, although only about 60% of people with migraine have one-sided head pain. Um, moderate to severe in intensity. I actually like to substitute in disability there because the, those Likert scales, the zero to 10, you know, are, are not so accurate or reproducible from person to person, uh, let alone within the person. But disability is, is very reasonable substitution. Uh, pulsing or throbbing in quality and, and worsening with movement make up the rest of that first column. And then you need to have either sensitivity to light and loud noise or nausea. You don't actually need frank vomiting. In fact, I prefer people that frankly vomiting in my office. But uh, take it to the next slide. So that's the basic criteria, but uh, migraine is actually a lot more than that. And as I mentioned before, a lot more than just bad head pain. So uh, about 20% of people with migraine have an aura uh, in association that occurs just before the beginning of the migraine. And that's a, uh, a brief, uh, fully reversible neurologic uh, symptom, uh, often visual changes, but you can see things like weakness on one side, sensory changes, um, sometimes difficult, particularly when they occur later in life and without the head pain uh, to distinguish from stroke. Although, uh, again, the stereotyped repetition is one of the ways that you can distinguish that. And also uh, around the, uh, the headache, a number of people have both prodromal and postdromal phases. So uh, these actually uh, are, uh, can be mood changes, changes in level of energy, of sleeping, uh, yawning, uh, food cravings occur in the prodromal stage. It's the reason why chocolate sometimes blamed for a migraine because you get hungry, you reach for something fast, you eat the chocolate and you get the headache and then you say, damn you, Milton Hershey. And actually it's a lot like blaming uh, pregnancy on, on pickles and ice cream. Um, but you know, people want to have that trigger to hold on to, although sometimes far more complicated than we'd like. And that post phase can look very similar as well. Go to the next. 
So I mentioned about tension type headache. Again, you have to have repeated episodes, at least uh, 10 of them occurring uh, uh, on average less than, uh, well, actually, once again, when you get to more than 15 days a month, we start using that term chronic tension type. But these events can last much longer, anywhere up to seven days. Uh, uh, again, differently, they tend to be more bilateral, uh, dull, vice-like, or band-like pain, mild to moderate intensity, and generally not worsening with, with uh, uh, other regular activity. Um, there's usually no nausea or vomiting. You can have either light or sound sensitivity, but, but generally not both. And what makes it difficult is sometimes we do see tension headaches and other types of headaches in migraine sufferers. And uh, um, that's one of the things that sometimes complicates diagnosis. So I mentioned before about cluster headache. That's one of uh, a number of trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. Uh, that is uh, um, uh, headaches with those other associated autonomic features. So uh, I mentioned the restlessness, but other parasympathetic uh, roles include droopiness of the eye, redness, tearing, nasal drainage or congestion, um, a change in the pupillary size, although I've yet to see a cluster sufferer who noticed that because they spent so much time uh, restless and upset about this. And again, I mentioned very high rate of, of suicide, about eight times that of the general population in this group. And these events uh, are stereotyped. They cluster together in time. Most people are episodic, which means they go into it for weeks or months and then come out of these cycles. They occur at very specific times of day and probably involve uh, input from our pineal gland and our circadian rhythm. Um, and then there's other uh, uh, ones within this group, uh, conditions like hemicrania continua, paroxysmal hemicrania, uh, sunk or summa syndromes. These vary in the length of time of events, the number of events per day, and in some cases are particularly responsive to uh, an anti-inflammatory indomethacin uh, for really unknown reasons. So you do want to distinguish these from secondary headaches. A primary headache is where the headache is the primary problem as opposed to where it is uh, a secondary to another condition. I hate this terminology because it just tells us how much we don't know. Um, you know, if we were confident migraine was a, a channelopathy and due to, you know, sodium potassium pumps, we'd say secondary to channelopathy. So instead, we hide behind this primary terminology instead. And uh, this is the thing that we're concerned. Are we missing infection? Are we missing other disorders of homeostasis, like somebody's sodium is off? Uh, uh, could it be uh, due to a psychiatric disorder? Could it be due to uh, a stroke or a tumor? So very difficult at times, but there, there are some guidelines to this. I think we have on our next slide the uh, mnemonic SNOOP. I hate mnemonics. I always forget what they stand for. So in this case, there are some substitutions to make it a little easier. So uh, the S stands for systemic or secondary risk factors. So uh, things like if you are immune compromised, uh, uh, cancer, treatment of cancer, pregnant, um, the, uh, then that changes the differential for other secondary risks. Uh, the same thing if you have a fever or weight loss, you know, those are things that may be indicative of other conditions. Uh, the N stands for neurologic features. And again, I mentioned you can have the aura, but uh, if you have focal neurologic deficits that don't go away, that's, that's a major warning sign of a secondary issue. The O's, the first one is onset. I hate the term worst headache of your life because you're really looking for uh, the onset being sudden or thunderclap, you know, peaking its reach reaching its peak intensity in, in about a minute. Um, you know, uh, uh, worst headache of your life is terrible because if you've ever had a headache, by definition, you've had the worst headache of your life. So you're really looking at the onset. And older age, that's another relative thing. I, I actually, I would say after age 50 is the number I'd be more concerned. And that's just uh, statistically, because again, the peak prevalence of migraine is in the 40s. So nuance that after that is, is not uh, uh, knocking older people, that, uh, but, but looking just at the statistics. And, and then the P stands for, for a change in past history, uh, progression of the condition, uh, 
and and sometimes people will substitute in things like papilledema or pregnancy, although those are addressed in the other ones we mentioned. All right, last couple of minutes, I'm gonna talk uh, about treatment. Um, the, uh, so there's kind of two strategies here. One is an acute treatment, something that you can do uh, when the event has started to occur. The other is a preventive strategy, something to do before they come on. And, and these break into not just pharmacologic treatments, oh, you can go ahead, the, uh, not just pharmacologic treatments, but you know a range of different non-pharmacologic management. So that I will leave to my colleagues, but I'll talk just briefly about the pharmacologic management of it. Again, when we talk about acute treatment, uh, that can break into non-specific treatments. And in fact, really makes up a big history uh, of, of, of pharmacology uh, from opiates and non-steroidals, which are non-specific treatments from the 19th century, uh, steroids, anti-nausea medications, uh, combination analgesics, like everybody's favorite, Excedrin. Um, and then uh, started to uh, see some more specific treatments with uh, ergotamines in the 1950s, leading to uh, uh, triptans like sumatriptan or imitrex in 1992. And then most recently, as you've been probably seeing tons of commercials, uh, medications like uh, uh, the uh, G-pants, uh, that is things like Nurtec or Ubrelvi, um, the uh, and uh, Ditan, which is a more cardiac safe uh, 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 acute medication specific. We've seen an advance in devices, peripheral stimulation devices like Cephaly, Nerivia, Relivion devices that have less evidence than uh, oral medications. But a lot of that is simply because of the resources and the research studies that have been done for them. But again, these are devices that have evidence. I could give you a host of them that are used that have no evidence as well. So, you know, an area that's still growing. Next slide. So I mentioned the acute meds, but uh, preventive treatment is far underutilized, less than 20% of the people uh, that would be appropriate for prevention and actually use it. Only a few of them are FDA approved uh, for this. That is uh, uh, a few anti-seizure medications, Devalproex and Topiramate, and a few beta blockers, Propanolol and Timolol. Um, and then that changed or started to change about 10 years ago when botulinum toxin or Botox was FDA approved strictly for chronic migraine, that more frequent state I mentioned. And that was followed by the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. That is much more specific preventive treatments uh, that, uh, that came out and were approved in the last uh, five years. Uh, medicines, uh, the trade names of which Amavig, uh, and Galati, Ajovi, Biepti may be much more familiar. And then within really the last year, we've seen a new range of more specific oral uh, preventive medications. Uh, the the GPANS uh, medications like Nurtec or Qlipta uh, that again may be used as a preventive, not just acute meds. Now, there are some other uh, medications that are used that are not FDA approved. Um, they, other heart medications, ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor binders, some of the other uh, antidepressant medications, both older ones like tricyclics and uh, newer SNRI, Effexor, that have been used as well. Next slide. So uh, just to wrap up with a, a, a last little bit, pediatrics, much more difficult. Far fewer things are studied. Uh, there is evidence for the use of some of the triptan medications acutely, uh, particularly in adolescents, rise of triptan down to age six, uh, ibuprofen well studied, uh, but then many other things not uh, studied acutely. Preventively, to pyramate again, approved for age 12 to 17, uh, calcium channel blocker not available in the US, Funarazine is fairly good evidence. But many of the other things that we use is very questionable. Um, the uh, amitriptyline, while it's been used, some question, uh, actually a very good question in the CHAMP study, um, whether there's, uh, this is as beneficial as good behavioral management as well. I'm 
probably hear about that a little bit later. So uh, last thing I'll leave you with is just a warning that too much medication is no good. I spend a lot of time here uh, getting people out of rebound. It's, it complicates about 70% of chronic daily headache. Um, and, uh, um, you know, is something that people uh, often do to themselves over the counter, see physicians who out of best of intents actually worsen. Uh, so um, the, uh, uh, it's just something to keep in mind with prescription that the best of intents sometimes complicates the picture. And this is where I would turn it over because medication itself is, is best used or augmented when there is good uh, talk therapy, behavioral treatment, really uh, the rest of the care of a patient as well. And that's where I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much, Dr. Rosen. So um, uh, Dr. Benor and I are gonna go through evidence-based behavioral treatments. I'm an adult um, health psychologist and Dr. Benor is a pediatric um, health psychologist. So we're gonna do a little bit of a tag team. Um, in general, uh, we have uh, grade A evidence, which means that we're pretty confident that these things are efficacious to reduce um, migraine attack frequency um, for biofeedback, uh, relaxation, as well as cognitive behavioral and stress management therapies. Of course, CBT is a large bucket, so I'm going to talk a little bit about more about what that means as we go on. Um, I want to go ahead and say, just because I, I, I just redid some of these meta-analyses with some new effect sizes, and I'm, I'm always struck at the large effect sizes for biofeedback for migraine. They're just, they're just really large. They're um, definitely comparable, if not a little bit stronger, than many of our uh, um, preventive medications that Dr. Rosen just shared with you. So we can feel pretty confident that some of the evidence-based strategies that most of us have learned in graduate school or in training afterwards can be helpful with this population. There's emerging evidence in adults, particularly for mindfulness-based interventions. The results are a little bit mixed for headache frequency as a primary outcome, but are unequivocal for headache-related disability as a primary outcome. So for patients who are experiencing high levels of headache-related disability, I would say that, that we have enough evidence at this point to say that a mindfulness-based intervention could be indicated. There's also emerging evidence for aerobic exercise that looks pretty good. Yoga is very emerging, and there are some challenges with certain positions. I wouldn't just recommend patients go to any old yoga class. Um, but, and then there's emerging evidence for a variety of healthy, of healthy diets, uh, but all very, very much emerging at this point. And I'm sure there'll be more evidence shortly in children. Um, there's great evidence for relaxation and self-hypnosis. Um, there's probable evidence for thermal biofeedback as well as other forms of biofeedback. Um, CBT data has inconsistent methodology, but I'm going to show you some very strong evidence or Dr. Benor will show you some very strong evidence later on that suggests that. A CBT protocol that's been developed by our colleague Scott Powers at Cincinnati um, is looks like it it is at least as effective of, as medications for children and um, likely more. Um, in adults, I think that it's important to note that the combination of preventive medication or some kind of preventive medical treatment. I really like working with people who are taking devices right now and behavior change is the most effective. Um, so patients who are really ready to dive in to migraine prevention um, are much more likely to see benefit. Um, so um, particularly for disability as an outcome, uh, CBT outperforms most preventive medications. And this is a, was a head-to-head -head comparison in a trial with uh, beta blocker medications. But um, when you look across trials that affect sizes for disability as an outcome, you do tend to see stronger um, effects, larger magnitude of effects for CBT and other behavioral treatments for adult migraine compared to medications. In children, um, CBT is, is superior to placebo, whereas most of the drugs we're using right now are not. Um, these are striking evidence from two trials. They're different trials. We don't have a head-to-head -head for CBT versus drugs in children the same way we do with adults. On the left, you're going to see that um, CBT outperformed placebo um, which was an extremely high contact, matched contact actually, and also matched format, very high contact control. Um, in a um, two-arm randomized clinical trial. And even with that 
large placebo effect that you saw in these children, um, CBT still out, still outperformed a very, very active um, behavior change placebo. Whereas amitriptyline and topiramate, which at the time were the two most commonly prescribed medications for children, um, did not outperform placebo at all. And in fact, the trial was stopped due fu to futility uh, because if anything was going to outperform anything else, it was going to be placebo. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work to be done in pediatrics in general, but after these data came out, um, pediatric headache centers around the country have had a large hiring spree of health psychologists and our pediatric health psychology colleagues have, have eclipsed <laughs> those of us adult folks, uh, in the last couple of years, because people just recognize the importance of, um, behavioral medicine of health psychology for pediatric headache disorders. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the, um, the initial evaluation, and then Dr. Benora is going to take you through relaxation and biofeedback. We'll come back to me for CBT. So what do you do when you have a person show up in your clinic who has a headache disorder? Um, the behavioral and psychosocial evaluation should include some discussion of headache symptoms because look, our neurology colleagues and sometimes primary care colleagues, you know, two thirds of migraine is treated in primary care. If you're in an IPC setting, you absolutely may be getting these folks in primary care. Our colleagues don't have enough time all the time to sit down and really talk with patients. And I can't tell you at, at Montefiore, which is my primary clinical site, how many times, even though they, these are some of the best neurologists in the world to talk, to talk about headache, um, you know, sometimes you, patients just tell you more symptoms because they got more time sitting with you. So talk to them about their symptoms, really try to understand and keep those SNOOP criteria in the back of your head, because you want to understand, is this potentially dangerous or is this a bread and butter primary headache disorder that, that, you know, I, has been sent my way. Um, so you want to understand frequency, length, characteristics, associated symptom. When did it start? How has it changed? And family history. Um, what we really start to care about is headache related disability migraine by some estimates um, by the world health organization is the second leading specific cause of disability worldwide second only to chronic pain so migraine is extraordinarily disabling you also heard from dr rosen about how extremely painful cluster headache is people who are struggling with cluster headache it's, it's much less prevalent but in a specialty care headache center, you're going to see it. And if you end up developing relationships with those colleagues, they will likely send cluster headache patients to you because they experience significant disability and significant psychosocial distress related to having this very, very painful and predictable uh, experience recur in their lives. Um, but we saw that lifetime prevalence graph earlier. And I think that's important to keep in your mind when you think about migraine related disability. This is very different than chronic lower back pain, where many of our patients are older, we're nearing retirement or maybe retired now. And for them, the disability is about not being able to get out and enjoy things in life. For people with migraine, they're experiencing significant levels of unpredictable disability during the times when in their life where they're supposed to be going to college, they're supposed to be starting jobs, they're supposed to be having children. Some of our recent data from the Cameo study show that a lot of people are actually putting off or deciding not to have children because they're so worried about how their migraine would impact those kids. Um, even people who do hold careers, have, have kids, ha try to have a full life, often experience what we call presenteeism, which is not being able to be fully present in the moment while you're trying to engage in a role responsibility. And that's a major source of disability that comes uh, with migraine. Um, and then finally, you need to make sure that you understand how people are supposed to be managing their, their migraine attacks. It's also critical you really need to get a release of information on every one of your headache patients and talk to their neurologist or PCP because you'll hear one story from the patient that says, these are the medications I take and this is how. And then you'll talk to the provider and say, okay, what medications do you expect this patient is taking and how do you want them to take them? often very different stories. Patients are taking preventive medications acutely. They're saving medication, acute medications that they're supposed to take every time. They're saving it only for once every six months for the bad one, you know. So you really want to understand not only what are patients doing, but also is there a discrepancy between what the medical provider expects them to be doing and what they're actually doing in real life. It's also important for us to assess lifestyle interventions. So, um, Patients engage in a lot of lifestyle management. It is important for you to know, know more than just the medication they're taking acutely when they get a migraine or some other headache attack, but it's also important to know what, what are their behaviors? 
are you able to keep working or do you need to remove yourself to a dark room or are you going home for the day and sleeping it off in your bedroom? Um, how disabled are you during an attack and what do you do to help yourself feel, feel better? Um, we don't have a ton of behavioral intervention, acute behavioral intervention evidence for things that we recommend that people do. Um, but a lot of the things that we would talk about for prevention later, we'll talk about things like staying well hydrated, making sure that you eat consistently throughout the day, doing stress management. They can be translated into an acute setting, like remove, remove yourself from the stressful situation, turn off the lights, drink a big glass of water and have a snack. You know, that is a nice acute management strategy for a lot of patients. Preventively, you want to understand how much stress your patients have and not only how much stress, but what are the variations in their stress? Because it turns out that variations, both increases as well as sudden decreases in stress are associated with headache attack onset for both migraine and for tension type headache. So we do care about people's stress in their lives. Um, sleep is also critically important. So those of you who are already trained in CBTI, you know how to do these assessments, but you want to understand people's timing of their sleep, when they go to bed, when they actually fall asleep, how often they're waking and how long those wakings are. You want to understand the quality of their sleep. And then particularly important for migraine and tension type headache is consistency of sleep. We do not want people sleeping in on the weekends. We do not want people staying out late one, one night a week. We really want people to have as consistent as possible a schedule. And I ha often have to work with patients, for example, about time changes and jet lag will be something that we prepare for to try to reduce the likelihood of a migraine attack. Um, we worry about skipping meals and regular hydration. So you don't just want to know their diet. You really want to know the timing. Are they fasting for long periods of time? Do they often miss lunch? We do care a lot about caffeine and alcohol. These are the two most important dietary triggers that have actual evidence and actual biological plausibility for, for their triggering. So we want to know how much caffeine they're having and alcohol, but we also want to know, we care mostly about large quantities. I really want to know about four or more alcoholic drinks. I really want to know about three or four cups of coffee rather than just one. Physical activity also because higher levels of physical activity can be an intervention. One of the biggies that we're going to talk about when I talk about CBT is beliefs about precipitants. Um, asking patients, what is it that you think causes your migraine is extremely helpful and can give us lots of potential tre treatment targets. Um, patients often develop really complex belief structures around what they think triggers their migraine attacks or other uh, headache attacks. So it's important for us to be able to evaluate what they are, because as Dr. Rosen said, many things that may be perceived to be triggers are, are, are factors that are occurring during the premonitory phase, and they're related to symptom perception. So for example, many people will say bright lights trigger my migraine attacks. But we have some pretty compelling evidence that patients who have migraine are already in a photophobic state. They're already super sensitive to light in the 24 hours before the pain starts. So maybe bright lights, certainly bright lights and like flashing lights that, you know, sure, that could certainly lower the threshold for migraine. But another plausible explanation is you notice lights more because you're already photophobic. Um, similarly, you want patients, you want to understand how much you think patients, they're in that their environment controls their migraines, their medications um, versus themselves. Um, internal locus of control, the idea I control my migraine attacks, that may not be great in this population. That can be stigmatizing and disabling. But what is we know is unhelpful is the idea that nothing can control my migraine attacks. Their fate, I'm at their whim, right? We want to show people that migraine and other headache disorders are patterns. They're patterns of their interaction between their brain and their environment, and that we're going to help them understand those patterns and work with them to improve their symptoms. Um, it's important to assess for psychiatric comorbidities. Briefly, anxiety is highly comorbid, particularly GAD and panic. Depression is also comorbid and is particularly important for people who have sensory hypersensitivity, sensitivity to smell, sensitivity to touch. For those of you who work often with bipolar patients, you probably see very high rates of migraine. Um, so the prevalence of migraine is about 34% in people with bipolar. And in some studies that only looked at bipolar two, it's up to half, it's tons of folks. Um, there's less evidence for comorbidity in kids. Um, you're gonna have most people take a headache diary. 
the things that I want to highlight about the diary is that you don't just want to know headache, yes, no. You ideally want to include, if you're working with people with migraine, you want to include some migraine symptoms. So you see if they got those symptoms that day or if it could have been something else. I love to try to have people uh, track their warning signs um, because it will help them take their acute medication earlier, which is part of acute medication adherence. You want to have people tell you what meds they took, um, but you also want to know the behavioral coping they did as well as the impact on their lives. Because people, some people may continue to have as many headache days, but the duration is less long and it impacts their life that, you know, less. These are um, a, pr a pretty good list of potential premonitory symptoms. Dr. Rosen also already showed you some. This is the list I give people to say track these for warning signs. So I'll write each out in plain English. We'll identify the top 10 people notice, and then that will be their individual headache diary to try to figure out what their actual warning signs are. Um, the most common are being tired, difficulty concentrating, and having a stiff neck. The problem is that people are often tired. People often have difficulty concentrating, and people often have stiff necks. So the highest predictive utility um, is actually yawning. If you have a patient whose warning sign is yawning, you're in really good shape because that is often a very specific warning sign, as well as difficulty with speech. Um, and then some people uh, report feeling anxious or depressed. Um, all right. I think that we are on to Dr. Benor. All right, excellent. So um, I will begin uh, going over uh, the treatment overview. Again, I'm a pediatric psychologist and I spend more of my time um, in the patient room um, than in the classroom. And uh, so, so you may have a, I don't know if my opinion will be slightly different or my perspective will be anyways. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we'll, we'll run through these. Um, so it's often best uh, when you're first working with a patient to identify the goals for treatment. Why am I seeing a psychologist for headache? And um, a good reason is when you look at the evidence of how um, these interventions that psychologists are well-trained in um, can help reduce the frequency and severity of headache. And as uh, Dr. Seng and Dr. Rosen already mentioned, looking at disability, reducing that disability, getting back to life as you want to live it um, is also important to track as a treatment outcome. Um, finding a way, and we'll talk about this when we talk about action plans, to really build um, a complementary uh, treatment plan uh, because medications may not be tolerated or in some cases, individuals are not interested in the medications. Another big part is enhancing this sense of control, um, self-efficacy. Um, uh, Betsy was just talking about predictability of the headaches um, that reduces some of the, um, I wanna say the, the emotional pain and stress of having um, these episodic or chronic symptoms. Um, and which really helps reduce, again, the headache-related distress or, or additional psychological symptoms comorbid with or secondary to uh, chronic headache. You can go to the next slide. So a first step in treatment really is education. Now, I, I know we're talking to psychologists here, so um, you don't have to speak at the level of, of neurology, but um, education often reduces anxiety and increases a sense of control. It is helpful for a patient to really understand then what type of headache do I have? What is the difference between a migraine and a tension type headache or a chronic migraine? Um, and so being able to um, be well-versed enough in the diagnostic categories so that you can um, converse well with your patient and help them understand uh, the features that they need to address is important. Um, another thing that's important from a, oh, I'm sorry, go back just real quick, um, is understanding the basic um, pathophysiology. So migraine has a, a very particular pathophysiology um, in terms of um, activating uh, the trigeminal nerves, in terms of um, cortical spreading depression, um, factors leading to both um, localized sensitization of nerves or more centralized sensitization. And I'm just throwing those terminologies out there um, because it's a little bit outside the scope here. The important part is that um, you have enough education on the pathology so that you can have an intelligent conversation about this with your patient and so that they trust you with the next stages of treatment. You can go on. 
So um, Dr. Sang did a, a, a wonderful study here looking at um, the threshold of migraine. And so again, going back to looking at the diary, um, a lot of people might say, yes, it was chocolate. Yes, it was caffeine. Yes, I didn't sleep well this night. Oftentimes, uh, migraine is more a factor of um, your body being more susceptible um, to develop a, a migraine. And it is usually more than one factor at a time. So when you're looking at a migraine diary or headache diary, what's important is to track that data, to track it over time. And then, you know, working with your psychologist or amongst yourselves, trying to find a pattern about what is uh, most predictable in terms of passing the threshold where you will then exhibit a migraine. This then leads to some of the other behavioral uh, steps that you might take. Another thing that's important when you're beginning treatment is really addressing the stigma of it. You know, a lot of people have headaches. Um, not a lot of people or less people have um, intense, severe, frequent headaches. And so it creates a secondary problem of societal um, stress or distress. And you can read some of the quotes here um, from this article. There's, a, there's some guilt, there's some blame, there's some psychosocial stressors that come to this. Being able to listen to your patient, hear their story, helps build that alliance so that then they can partner with you um, to um, work on the shared goals and to be more motivated for the tasks that you are gonna work on with treatment. So um, I, I have a lot to talk about in terms of relaxation, so I will not get into all of it right now. Um, but uh, it's important um, that you have a, a firm understanding of what relaxation is within the body. Um, relaxation is not just doing something that is quote unquote relaxing, like sitting down and just watching uh, my favorite TV show. Um, it is, I often describe it to my patients, again, I work more with kids, that it's like physical therapy for the nerves. It's stretching for the nerves. It's an exercise that you routinely practice so that your nervous system is better prepared to respond to the variations in stress over the day and better able to recover from periods of stress. So I often talk about allostatic load. Um, we talk about the sympathetic, parasympathetic nerves, uh, uh, nervous system, and how relaxation really strengthens that activation of the parasympathetic nerve. And there's a lot of talk about um, physiological awareness, so interception, in terms of what aspects of their body that they can identify with that respond to these interventions. That might cue them in more on whether or not it is a good time to do relaxation and whether or not they're feeling immediate response to this. I have patients sometimes who really wonder why I sat and I, I breathed slowly for 10 minutes, doc. How come I still have a headache? Uh, because it, it's a lot more than just one exercise to work. It is a regular practice that strengthens the nervous system within your body. Go to the next slide, please. So there are a variety of relaxation exercises. And, and just two comments on this. Many people practice very uh, varying modes of, of deep breathing or progressive muscle relaxation or autogenic training. Um, the, to date, um, there is no research that I'm aware of that, that pits one against the other and has a clear winner. And so we do not know um, that one relaxation method is better than another. I think that's okay for us. We can work with the patient and figure out which one seems to be best for that patient. What we do know is that um, relaxation alone in the various methods that have been introduced is a significant benefit to patients with headache. So working with them uh, on learning these skills and practicing on a regular basis is important. You know, if you look at the original studies of progressive muscle relaxation and autogenic training, it was not a five minute lesson in my office and I sent the patient home with a tape. It was, it was constant training over multiple sessions, very much in the same way that people might take a yoga class now. And so treating relaxation in the same way um, as it was originally intended as, as a practice to be um, completed regularly is uh, working best for your patient. Okay, biofeedback. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot to be said about biofeedback, and I'm going to split it into two different areas here. So one uh, way of thinking about biofeedback is, is what I would call biofeedback-assisted relaxation training. When your body is relaxed, there are physiological changes within your body. 
your heart rate might slow, your heart rate variability might increase, your um, peripheral temperature in your hands might increase, your hands might become warm and dry, um, varying muscles might loosen. So if you're looking at surface EMG, you might see lower, um, lower amplitude there. Um, and so you just are in reinforcing a, a quote unquote relaxed state. Um, and that can be helpful here. Headache though is one of the conditions that has had significant research, particularly in adults, um, to show that training on these modalities, um, increasing peripheral temperature, reducing muscle tension and increasing heart rate variability has shown direct um, reduction in headache symptoms. So the goals um, of biofeedback is, is um, uh, really increasing an awareness of what's happening in your body and learning to directly change that, figure out what is that switch inside my body um, that I can change the physiological processes. You can go to the next slide. It is real time, oh, I'm sorry, go, go back one, please. It is real-time assessment of what's happening inside your body. So I typically tell people it's about three things. Um, I, 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 was, I was taught this by another individual, so I won't take personal credit for it. Um, it is about awareness, control, and generalization. What is happening inside my body? By doing this real-time back and forth with the computer, you learn to control that sensation, and it just takes practice. And then the generalization part is learning how to apply it in the real world, not when I'm just sitting here staring at the app on my phone or working in the, in the office with the, uh, uh, the more fancy equipment. Um, but really, how do I do this in the morning? How do I do this in, in traffic? How do I do this when I'm stressed? Um, what biofeedback is helpful with is it creates that very specific real-time um, feedback and it often does it in, in a more um, pleasing kind of game format um, that increases, I think, one's motivation to continue with it. You can change it, please. Okay, so this is just an example of biofeedback. If you've never seen it before, um, this might be the recording after the session. Within the session, um, an individual might be um, viewing anything change on the screen colors changing, um, pictures moving or staying still, sound being added or not being added. Uh, really, in the last 10 years, software has, has um, increased what we can accomplish with biofeedback. But here in the first epic before, uh, before the dotted line, you see somebody just, um, uh, just kind of relaxing with, with no clear stress, um, warm, uh, dry hands. Um, that, that blue line in the middle is their respiration. You just see kind of slow, rather regular respiration. You do see that red line heart rate varying with respiration, um, which is a sign of good autonomic balance um, and a really relatively low uh, respiration rate. Um, in the middle epoch, you see the individual being stressed. You see this autonomic response. Um, and then it's prolonged afterwards um, in the third epoch, even though they are trying to regulate though. So the concept here, again, real-time data about what's happening in their physiological, uh, physiologically in their body so that they can then learn to modify it. Again, it takes practice. Next slide, please. So just three modalities that I'll go uh, over that are um, common with um, headache. And I will say, um, because uh, Dr. Sangin mentioned this earlier uh, about the efficacy, there's actually a new efficacy book coming out later this summer. On uh, It's a fourth edition on uh, efficacy of biofeedback. There's also a, a primer coming out. So for individuals who are not familiar at all with biofeedback and it feels a little overwhelming or daunting, um, this biofeedback primer that's coming out um, uses just remarkable language to um, reduce any anticipatory fear you might have of getting into the biofeedback world. Um, temperature biofeedback, it's a sensor attached typically to the periphery. It might be your hands or your fingers. It might be your feet or your toes. Um, with headache, um, the treatment typically is raising peripheral temperature. In fact, there was a study a long time ago, though, um, at uh, the Geisinger, no, the Manager Institute, um, where increasing peripheral temperature to 95 degrees greatly reduced migraines. Um, typically, treatment is about weekly. Um, it, it, you have to be ready to do temperature uh, biofeedback. Um, because in the beginning, you're not going to see immediate responses. No matter what you do in your body, it's going to take about 30 seconds for it to affect peripheral temperature. 
Um, and if you're working on increasing peripheral temperature, it might take up to five minutes of sitting quietly and doing the exercise before you notice a substantial effect. So it's best to prep people to be patient with this. It's very effective though. Next one. The next is looking at muscle tension. So again, these are um, sensors that are placed targeted on specific muscle tissues. Um, uh, oftentimes it could be the, the frontalis muscles, it might be the traps. Um, there are a lot of neck muscles that are sometimes harder to access with surface EMG. Um, and again, here you can see on some of the screens, um, on the lower left, you can see where um, the screen might pick up a very subtle um, increase in muscle tension, like shrugging your shoulders. Um, and in the right, this is the more um, modified screen to give patients feedback. Lower the tension in your shoulders, lower the tension in your shoulders. As you do, the lake will become more and more still, more and more calm. And again, it's that back and forth with the computer that helps patients get a better sense of what's happening inside their body. The computer's ability to amplify these signals and then display them in a very attractive um, means is what helps the patients learn from this. And the next one is heart rate variability, which I will say is relatively new. So data is, is actually quite well what we're learning with heart rate variability. You can actually um, learn the skill relatively quickly, which I think is also appealing. And also um, the technology on capturing heart rate variability through, um, through um, lower quality feedback devices are helpful. You know, this is, this is one that I have right now that just attaches to your ear, um, is a Bluetooth, um, sends it to your phone, and you can do the training there. Um, again, growing data, I think we're going to see a lot, lot more about heart rate variability. Um, typically, there are two methods to increase heart rate variability. One, um, and I'm not going to get into all of the details about it, but it is um, regulated or paced breathing typically at a certain rate that increases the rise and fall of the heart rate. Um, typically, as you breathe in, your heart rate will increase. As you exhale, your heart rate will decrease. And so it's finding that set rhythm of breath that's helpful. The second that there's a lot of research to support is just the concept of a positive emotion, a sense of appreciation or gratitude, which also increases heart rate variability. These are two things that psychologists are actually quite good at helping patients learn. This is just an example of a, of a child that I, I had worked with in the past um, that had, it's, it's a fake name, his name's not Luke, but um, he had a post-traumatic headache following uh, hitting his head on a locker. Now, he, um, that is not his first concussion. Um, he also had some, some asymmetrical uh, tension in his shoulders. What you can see in this graph, just demonstrating the physiological responses to biofeedback. So on the left-hand side, you can see um, his respiration rate, red line is baseline when he's not trying. Um, the green line is when he's actively engaged in, in, um, in biofeedback. And what you can see is that in both um, instances, both in baseline and when he's actively trying, you see gradual increases or actually decreases in his respiration rate. He's learning to breathe slow and controlled. What you see on the right-hand side is, is um, it's called low frequency percentage. It's just a, a one measure of heart rate variability. And you see the same thing there. You see that with practice, um, and on the bottom, we just list the various sessions that he was doing, um, you see a graduated increase in heart rate variability, not just when he's actively trying, but at baseline levels as well. So this is where we're seeing biofeedback can physiologically change the individual both when they're actively doing this and um, when they're not actively trying. And I believe I'll pass it back to you, Betsy. Thanks, Ethan. So um, those are some more basic pathophysiology-based approaches that you can use to try to really target headache symptoms themselves. Um, I think of, so um, in any CBT for headache protocol, everyone, those approaches, relaxation and biofeedback, are the core. They're the foundation. They're your home. They're where you go back to every single session. But obviously, CBT has a C in it. So there are some cognitive things that we can do with our patients that can really help um, them reduce the uh, extent to which 
migraine or other headache disorders are interfering with their lives. And for some of the other headache disorders that we um, have talked about today, so like, for example, for cluster headache, there's really no evidence that relaxation or biofeedback would necessarily help people with cluster headache. There's no evidence that it wouldn't. There's just a lot less evidence in that more rare disease. Um, but I work with a lot of cluster headache patients. I work with lots clinically. It's a common disease that I see. And these are people who need help with medication adherence and taking the things that are prescribed to them, but also who need, who need assistance with reducing the impact of disability on their lives. And to me, that's where cognitive structuring comes in. So we're all extremely familiar with the Beck model where core beliefs lead to intermediate beliefs that are then activated in particular situations with an automatic thought that can lead to either adaptive or maladaptive responses. Um, I, when you work with a lot of headache patients, as you dig deep, there are complex structures of intermediate beliefs related to headache, headache onset, um, and potential trigger factors that you sometimes will have to spend quite a lot of time disentangling. Um, so the major targets of CBT for headache are medication adherence really first. So um, up to 85% of patients with migraine are not taking a migraine specific medication at the first line of a migraine attack. And for migraine specific medications, there's pretty good evidence that if you wait too long to take them for at least two thirds of people, they won't work very well or may not work at all. So holding on to your medication past the point of efficacy is a maladaptive behavioral response. <laughs> and it's important for us as psychologists to understand why, why is this happening in the person sitting in front of me? Sometimes it's happening for situational reasons like, well, I only get so many and I have more attacks than that. But sometimes it's happening for belief related reasons. This medication is strong and I'm, you know, not able to handle it. Um, I, I'm going to get addicted. These medications are not in and of themselves addicting. A lot of things that you can then work with to try to improve people's adherence. Um, the second major target of CBT for headache is to lower relevant potential trigger factors. So um, trigger factors being the word patients will often use to talk about factors that um, uh, lower their migraine threshold or the a point at which they would have a migraine attack. I tend to not use the word trigger with my patients. I'll use um, pretty much any other word. <laughs> with healthcare providers, I use the word precipitating factors for obvious reasons, too long, not going to use it with patients. But I try to like to use patients' words with them, but I try to move them away from the idea that these are triggers because many of them may be premonitory symptoms. So the biggies that we care about are stress, sleep, and skipped meals and dehydration. So I will do diaries, calendars for sleep, for when they eat, for stress, depending on what seems to be the most problematic for the patient sitting in front of me. Um, there's recent evidence that shows that stress doesn't matter for potentially up to a third of people with migraine. So even though we talk a lot about, oh, you know, reduce stress, uh, do stress management, it's also important to remember that that may not be the biggest bang for your buck for every patient who walks through your door. And in fact, for me, I often find sleep is the first target I go for. So it's important to really assess what it seems to be dysfunctional in the life of the person sitting in front of you. Um, pretty much every person I work with will work on reducing anxiety and avoidance around perceived migraine triggers. By the time somebody comes to my office, they're often not eating out, never having any fun with their friends, never traveling. They sometimes have quit their jobs because of migraine. And these are people that we want to re-engage in life. Um, so we work slowly to, to, to build them back up to re-engaging in life. So I want to give you a couple of CBT examples. So um, stress and skipping meals as a CBT target. This is a really nice, you know, um, kind of uh, ABC diagram. So the situation is that you overslept. None of us this week can relate to that. Daylight savings time. Thank you very much. So you overslept, you get up late, you skip breakfast and you're late for work. This is stressful and you've skipped a meal. So the automatic thought is catastrophizing. This is the worst day ever. I'm never going to be able to finish all this work. I'm going to get a migraine. I'm going to go home. The catastrophic spiral leads all the way to losing your job, not being able to care for your family. And the outcome, which is really where we care, like, well, what's the behavioral response, is that people are frantically trying to finish their tasks. They don't rectify the skipped meal. They don't sit down and have hydration. They don't deal with some stress management. Because of that, they feel stressed, anxious, and overwhelmed, but it also increases the likelihood of another headache attack. So 
you might work through cognitive restructuring with this patient to think about rather than dealing with the stressful situation where they also have a potential trigger, skipping breakfast, say, you know, look, I've handled worse before. I'm confident that I can get everything I absolutely need you to get done today. And look, I might have a migraine attack, but if I do, I know what to do. I have my acute management plan. That's why I like to try to put people's acute management plans together first so that they can always fall back on, look, if I have an attack, I know what to do. So then the behavior is you make a list, you work on the high priority tasks, you grab breakfast on your way in, you have a big old glass of water, you might sit down, do a little bit of deep breathing for a couple minutes, and then you get down to business and focus on your tasks. So that's the way that we would try to use cognitive restructuring in this um, population. Um, reducing the anxiety and avoidance cycle is particularly important for this group. For I like when I'm talking to clinical psychologists, I like to say that migraine attacks are very similar to panic attacks in the way we deal with them. So it's the anticipation of the migraine attack sometimes that can be just as disabling as the attack itself. Worrying when you're going to get it. Is this going to ruin my daughter's wedding? Is this going to ruin my kid's play? What in the world am I going to do if, when I get a migraine on vacation? You know, these are things that can then lead people to just disengage in life altogether. So there's a nice protocol that came from a colleague of ours, Paul Martin, out of Australia called Learning to Cope with Triggers, where you can experiment to see if a perceived trigger is a migraine precipitant. Um, and then you practice coping with mild stressors to prepare for coping with more stressful situations. He's predominantly done this idea of learning to cope with triggers for stress specifically. Um, but I, I mean, I've had a number of patients, one uh, one of whom always kind of sticks out in my mind. She was very, very sure that parsley was a migraine trigger for her. And it, it became bigger than, than the vegetable, right? It became bigger than the herb. And it took out this outsized um, piece of her belief system. Um, when there wasn't strong biological plausibility, she didn't appear to have any food sensitivities or allergies related to those kinds of herbs. Um, so we, we did, we worked with her a little bit to say, well, what, what if we try it on a day when everything is going well, you don't really have any other precipitating factors. Let's go ahead and give it, a, give it a try. And because you're going to be anxious when you eat some, let's try to do some relaxation activities and do some mantras. And we did it all. And um, you know, she was able to go through a couple of times where she's eating foods that she had been a little bit afraid of before without a migraine attack. So um, reducing that anxiety and avoidance cycle can be really helpful. It's also important to remember that patients need to engage in self-care when they have unavoidable um, triggers. So um, women who, or people who menstruate uh, may have menstrual migraine. So they may just have a much lower threshold for migraine attacks around the period of time when they're um, menstruating. So um, for those people, there may be, you know, drug therapies that we use to try to raise that threshold back up. Um, but we also can try to really use good self-care strategies to try to do stress management and sleep and make sure you don't skip meals and make sure you're well hydrated so that you can do as much as you can to raise that threshold during that time of month. Similarly, you can't control the weather. There's just nothing about it that nothing I can do about that barometric pressure. So helping people um, regain a sense of control in uncontrollable events can be really helpful. Um, I think it's really important to note psych psychiatric comorbidity. So um, effective preventive treatment for migraine can result in very large treatment effects in people who are depressed or anxious. You do not need to solve their depression or anxiety before they can experience migraine frequency reduction. And in fact, if you effectively reduce their migraine their depression and anxiety might get a little bit better. Um, the most surprising thing that we found in some of our trials um, is that if you effectively treat people's migraine, they get people who are depressed or anxious actually have an opportunity to get even more better than people who are not depressed or anxious because there's some underlying um, biology that connects depression, anxiety, and migraine. And so people who are depressed and anxious have higher migraine symptoms just to start off with. So they have more room to grow. All of that to say, um, you know, sometimes you're going to be referred a patient who's depressed or anxious and has migraine or some other headache disorder. And the idea is, well, you need to fix the depression and anxiety first. In general, we would recommend co-treatment, right? Try to treat 
these things together. You've got them in your office. Try to give them some effective migraine management strategies at the same time as you're dealing with the depression and anxiety targets. And in fact, some of the targets may be similar. But similarly, um, good feedback to our medical colleagues can be, let's just try to treat this aggressively. Because if we hit some of the headache targets, some of the psychiatric targets may actually improve too. Um, CBT for insomnia is frequently used for people with uh, migraine and people with tension type headache. This is a sleep diary. If you're not so familiar with this, I would strongly encourage you to download some sleep diaries and see how they work. They're really fun. Patients like to fill them out. Um, and the goal is that over time you see more and more sleep consolidation. This person went to bed at 10, but then didn't actually fall asleep till 11. They woke up at two, got out of bed. They woke up at four. They didn't get out of bed till five. They stayed up for an hour and a half, tried to get some more sleep. This is a miserable night's sleep. With time, you can see people start to consolidate their sleep, more and more dark bars in the middle, and it can be very fun. The basic things that you do in CBT for insomnia uh, are to first reduce sleep interfering activation. This is typically called sleep hygiene. You might use relaxation. The big things, you don't want TV, phone, video games within one hour of going to sleep. You put together some kind of unwinding ritual to, that's, that promotes sleep. Try to exercise every day, but don't exercise within four hours of when you're supposed to be going to sleep. Um, low light in your sleep environment, and then you avoid stimulants, alcohol, and eating right before bedtime. Sleep hygiene alone is typically ineffective to actually produce major changes in people's sleep. So often you go on to the next stage, which is called stimulus control. In stimulus control, the idea is that you're pairing the bed with sleep. If you're sleeping, you're in bed. If you're not sleeping, get out of bed. So um, the bed is only for sleep and sex. And when you're doing st stimulus control, there are various strategies used to try to make that happen. The last thing for CBT for insomnia is sleep restriction. This is when you have people stay in bed only as long as they're currently sleeping. So you minimize the amount of time that they can spend in bed. The goal is to reduce being in bed, but not sleeping. Um, the last uh, slide that I wanna talk about right now is third wave therapies. So many of us have received uh, training or additional training after graduate school in mindfulness and mindfulness-based interventions, particularly mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, ACT. There is some evidence for each of these things in headache disorders. Um, the evidence for ACT is pretty good, especially for headache-related disability. The, the evidence for both MBSR and MBCT is pretty good and some relatively large pilot studies for headache related disability as a target, but less, less for headache days themselves. So as a clinician, what I like to say about mindfulness is that if you have a patient who still has a high amount of headache symptoms sitting in front of you, relaxation biofeedback are like your core, and then you can branch out into cognitive therapy some and try to, you know, really reduce their headache frequency. But if you have somebody whose headache frequency is low, they're effectively treated with medications or other, you know, strategies, but their disability is still off the charts. They still aren't going to work. They're still not engaging in life with their friends and family. Those are people for whom mindfulness-based interventions may be really effective. All right, Dr. Bernor. All right, thank you. So uh, for those of you who do uh, work with children as well, um, all of these interventions that we're talking about are helpful with them. I, I'm just going to share a couple of tips that I have found to be helpful as well. Um, so first off, uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, the child may be um, upset by the headaches, but, but maybe not the one uh, driving themselves to the appointment. And so you may have a slightly less motivated person. You also might have a person um, who is at varying levels of development um, in terms of understanding the interventions that you're um, using. And so uh, I use a lot of teaching tools, as many pictures as you can. I use a lot of videos. I use a lot of metaphors. Um, there's a nice uh, website um, out there for children um, called headacheliefguide.com. Um, which has some really good information out there. Um, the American Headache Society also has uh, uh, good resources. Um, the important part is um, to make it applicable for the child. Um, I use a lot of heuristics or mnemonics. Um, so we were talking about this new mnemonic, mnemonic before. Um, we'll talk about um, another one later. I use one for problem solving. I use one for just helping them identify um, core beliefs and responding to those. I use a, another one um, just for helping them remember which kind of exercise or coping skill they could be using. 
Um, it's a lot of behavioral practice. Um, written homework is helpful. It actually um, works quite well with kids because they're used to going somewhere and getting homework. Now, they sometimes roll their eyes with it, um, but the concept of being able to demonstrate that they're learning these skills and getting praise for that is important. And um, knowing that this homework uh, or exercise, whatever you want to call it, um, will directly translate into either headache reduction or, or reduction of disabilities. Um, motivational interviewing is often very helpful um, with these kids. I see a lot of kids with chronic headache and focusing on um, how the headache has actually impacted them um, may get them to a, a higher stage of change um, and focusing on their goals and values um, so that they are they can directly link um, how the activity that they're learning with me um, will connect to one of their future goals or values. Um, there's a lot of questioning, developing insights into um, symptoms, physiology, um, uh, headache triggers. So the, the next one is more about um, uh, Heidi Bloom came up with uh, this heuristic, which I just love, um, which is smart behaviors. Um, and so it's helpful to use this as a way to organize uh, those um, uh, those lifestyle factors that we talked about um, to be helpful for kids. And you can modify this um, as needed for the child, but it does help kids understand, am I doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing? Or am I only doing one or two things that's supposed to help um, prevent my headaches? You can go to the next slide. Another thing that I do with um, children is we do come up with a headache action plan. Now, um, I, I initially took this uh, from the asthma population who actually has done a wonderful job with an action plan. Um, the American Headache Society also now has their own action plan, um, which is very similar. The concept is very um, uh, basic. What are the things that I'm doing every day to try to prevent these headaches? If I get into a tricky situation, like I'm stressed out, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overtired. What am I going to do at that stage two to kind of help prevent the headaches? What do I do when I have the headache to cope with it, get through the situation faster? And then after the headache, how do I return to activities? So you can think about all those varying stages of migraine um, and think about um, what, how, how the child or how a, a person might um, intervene for their healthcare. It also becomes a very helpful tool to organize their communication with the physicians. Physicians don't have that much time to ask question after question after question. This is a very helpful tool for that. Now, if individuals, kids anyways, um, do not act alone. And so sometimes it's helpful to clarify what the parents will do. Oftentimes, the less the parents do, the better. But it's nice to know. Mom's job is to remind me to take my medicine. Um, dad is going to be, uh, doing yoga with me two times a week because, you know, I'm more interested in doing it if I did it with somebody else. Um, so having a, a parent aspect of the plan is important. You can go to the next slide. So also Strayhorn, um, has come up with, um, several strategies for parents. So, and you can think about this as, as other family members as well, but, um, uh, oftentimes, it's important for parents to have just as much understanding of headaches um, as the child. So understanding stress, um, understanding um, how to manage stress or manage the stress debt uh, is the term in the article. Um, creating a language for self-regulation. What does it mean um, if your energy is running too high or if you're getting overwhelmed? Creating that language so that kids can understand what's happening in their body emotionally, physically, communicate it and respond appropriately giving them time, space to practice these skills, it doesn't take long, but it does take repetitive practice. So before, before dinner, you know, I'm getting some stuff ready. How about you go sit down and do your exercises? Um, you know, I'd really, I'd really be curious to go over that homework with you before you go to bed tonight. So take a look at it. Um, modeling stress management is probably one of the keys. So parents who read, have kids who read. If your kid sees you read, they're more likely to read. If they see you managing stress, they are more likely to manage their stress better. So do this out in the open, um, as long as it's in a healthy way, um, and let your child see how that you are managing stress. Using scaffolding approach is often um, very helpful. Uh, just the concept, if you want to talk about it from a growth mindset, um, that starting at the beginning is okay. If all we got done uh, this week was we clarified your healthy lifestyle habits. 
that's okay. We'll keep building off of that. Um, and then really focus on what you're praising with children. Um, not praising just a headache-free day. Um, praising their effort, praising practice, um, praising um, uh, 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 th those types of activities, you'll, you'll get more bang for your buck. And I don't know, um, uh, Dr. Singh, is there time to do the concussion or do we need to move forward? There's time to do the concussion. Okay, great. So um, I spent a lot of time also dealing with um, individuals with concussion. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, oftentimes it is not just, the, the kids that are coming to my office are not just uh, uh, having their first concussion, it's multiple concussions. Um, with multiple concussions, there's, there's neurocognitive symptoms, there's also emotional distress. The longer this progresses, um, uh, the more they might suffer from some of these symptoms. And there seems to be kind of a, a, a downward cycle of um, concussion that does not immediately uh, respond. Again, your first concussion, you know, at least um, uh, half are going to respond within about two weeks. Close to 90% are going to respond, just uh, recover within about a month. Um, multiple concussions, um, not so much. And for individuals, uh, there still is that small percentage of 10% of that may struggle um, with concussions, um, prolonged symptoms. You can go to the next slide. So um, individuals that have additional um, comorbid psychopathology, so anxiety and depression, obviously the two most common ones, tend to have more trouble when they have concussion. So if someone is coming to you um, with um, post-traumatic headache um, and you also identify um, anxiety and depression, um, pay attention. Um, if someone you're treating somebody for anxiety and depression, and they have concussion, um, know that they may have additional difficulties with adherence to treatment um, and with responding uh, or having symptom resolution in appropriate enough time. Um, also, and, and uh, Dr. Seng already did a wonderful job addressing the cognitive aspects of this, um, but um, additional um, uh, cognitions, um, can worsen management of concussion and recovery. Um, kind of the, the, the woe is me or the helpless, hopeless cognitions um, tend to lead to uh, greater difficulty for these individuals. They also then misattribute um, signs of, of tension, um, hyperarousal, or, or cognitive fatigue. Um, so you have some physical fatigue uh, after this, but a lot of individuals with concussion may also suffer from cognitive fatigue. Some people don't do anything and they just rest for a week. And then they're also struggling more because of that. So um, you can go to the next one. Now, you will see more research coming out about post-traumatic headache. This is un, um, uh, this uh, data at the bottom is actually um, unpublished data from something that we had done. Um, but um, uh, uh, individuals in general, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing the, um, uh, the McCready reference, um, did show that individuals benefited from heart rate variability biofeedback. Now, it's hard to see in the graph. So what I will say is that it was a non-significant trend for quicker reduction of symptoms. Now, this is looking at all individuals with concussion, individuals, uh, not individuals with prolonged post-traumatic headache. Um, but there is growing evidence for um, biofeedback and other uh, interventions to assist uh, post-traumatic headache specifically. And this is just a, a, another case example of a 17-year-old female um, who came to my office with two concussions in probably about a uh, little over two months um, time um, oftentimes I don't see individuals right after they get the concussions. So I, I get them years afterwards when they're still struggling with it. And so you can see the presentation of headache it's in the frontal region, um, moderately intense. Seven is, I would say, is the most common number that I hear. Um, and it's daily, it's constant, it's not going away. Now this individual did have comorbid anxiety and depression with suicidal ideation. Um, obviously, we provided uh, the supports um, to keep the individual safe regarding suicidality. You can go to the next slide. Uh, 
I think we lost the slide, but as, as, as it's coming back up, I'll share um, what was performed with this uh, child is very similar to what was shared um, earlier in terms of headache diary, um, strong focus on sleep hygiene. Uh, we did utilize uh, biofeedback, predominantly biofeedback assisted relaxation training. Um, with some focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, again, specifically to address the anxiety and depressed mood that was comorbid. And um, what you may see uh, in the slide was that the individual um, continued on um, through seven sessions and after about seven sessions, um, just had a dramatic reduction in the duration of headaches. Now that is not a common response. What I typically see is individuals uh, will gradually show a reduction in headache severity and intensity, um, or if if there's disability for such a long period of time, they might actually show a reduction in disability before a reduction in headache intensity or um, headache duration. Um, the the data that was shared here was just a a, a more dramatic effect. Um, but wanted you to see how quickly an individual could respond uh, to these individuals. Or to, I'm sorry, to this intervention. And while I don't see, um, Betsy, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna try to pull up this as well, because um, I believe um, Dr. Rosen, it is um, back to you talking about how to partner with headache physicians. So I'll try to pull up the presentation. You know, I, I, I think I could probably share my screen and do that. Wonderful. Okay. Give me just one more. All right. So, so uh, with a little bit of luck, you all uh, are seeing my screen now. Um, uh, if you're not, just give me uh, uh, just give me a heads up um, if uh, if you can't see the screen. But you know, again, I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes. I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions because you know. Uh, uh, it, Hopefully, many of you have been keeping them up, and you know I, I know this is a, a great area for for further discussion. Um, but you know it is actually very important uh, uh, for me to talk uh, about this about you know really how to partner with uh, with headache physicians. Although um, you know the part of the problem, and actually this is where some of my research is uh, access to care. Uh, for headache subspecialists, and I'll show you a slide in just a moment about the issues with that. Um, the uh, when you look at who actually is a headache specialist, this is a highly debated area. But uh, one marker of it, uh, there is a, a certifying body, the uh, the UCNS, that's the United Council of Neurologic Subspecialties. So this is an organization uh, that's created by. Uh, uh, several different parent organizations, the American Academy of Neurology, uh, the uh, uh, United uh, uh, Academy of United Professors of Neurology, uh, the, uh, Child Neurology, um, and uh, the uh, American Neurologic Association came together. And uh, they certify specialties such as neurocritical care, um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, uh, neuro-oncology, and uh, of course, headache medicine. So there's um, now uh, about 12 years of certification and uh, just over 700 um, 
uh, physicians uh, that that are certified in this way, and that's that's around the country. Um, so you know, this is uh, one marker of uh, um, a specialist uh, uh, ability or capability, uh, at least to uh, to be able to do the paperwork, take exams, and uh, and demonstrate the academic. Um, uh, competencies uh, to be called a headache subspecialist, but it doesn't recognize the work of uh, uh, other healthcare providers, such as uh, psychologists, uh, um, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants who, who may have had uh, as much, if not even more, uh, experience in the area. So there are other certifications, but when you look at uh, uh, again uh, physicians, this is this is really the major group of them, and uh, they are scattered around the country. Although there are still several states that have no uh, certified headache specialists, you can find them through the American Migraine Foundation. Uh, which is a great website to go to uh, both for patient information, healthcare provider information, and also for finding a physician as well. Um, the, uh, that links to the American Headache Society, which helped sponsor today's lecture, which is the academic body. Um, and uh, um, there are uh, um, uh, some excellent uh, online resources through both. I'll tell you that if you just uh, Google migraine, you'll find all sorts of uh, quite crazy things. And that is the way that a lot of people achieve their care. So, you know, I, I can tell you in my own experience, uh, uh, once you do link together with a provider, this is often a wonderful relationship, um, you know, especially if you can establish that clear line of communication, because um, you know, sharing uh, uh, about patients' uh, resources, uh, updates, feedback uh, that, that patients have received is, is benefits everyone. But uh, on the same end of it, that is setting expectations of care, understanding, you know, what the physician may be responsible for, um, the, uh, uh, what uh, uh, healthcare uh, providers in general, the roles that they have, is very important uh, early on as well. So there's clarity and purpose in that way. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, really it, it often starts clinically, but uh, but a lot of this is about establishing community. And, uh, and that's really just a, a great thing in many ways. And coming from the clinical end, you know, that leads to uh, educational opportunities. Um, I know that uh, our uh, 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 neuropsychologists join us for our grand round sessions, and you know, it was great to, to have that on an educational end and having them uh, educating our neurologists. Uh, but on the research end as well, there's a lot of opportunity for cross fertilization. And you know, again, uh, Dr. Seng uh, and I have uh, had the opportunity to work together, and I, I have to say, it's just mind expanding to me. Uh, uh, every time we, we get to interact, and I, I can speak, you know, uh, very highly, not just of, of, of the research we've produced, but the process uh, of doing research as well. Um, the, uh, so I mentioned just about that referral pipeline, and it's important to remember that people, uh, not patients, but people really end up uh, entering that in many different directions. And, um, you know, it's important that regardless of where they enter the, that, that system, that, uh, that they, um, you know, get resources that are appropriate for them. Um, you know, as a headache specialist, again, I just said 700 in the country, and we did a paper many years ago, uh, which is being updated now, uh, um, just locating those specialists around the country, comparing them to demographic data. And what you really see, I think this is actually an overestimate of the number of, of migraine patients that are seen in headache centers, you know, really less than 1% uh, could possibly come through that, that, that those doors, um, far less than 1%. So, you know, where, where else do they achieve uh, their care? Um, uh, well, uh, many do make their way to neurologists, but again, keep in mind that there's about a thousand or twelve hundred uh, neurology graduates per year, so uh, even that's a limited resource of people that make it uh, to that uh, care. 
Um, so most people get their care in a primary care setting, uh, whether it be uh, uh, their pediatrician, their internist, their family practice, Dr. OBGYNs, um, you know, sometimes in specialized care like ophthalmology they enter in, uh, unfortunately some through the emergency room setting. Um, you know, th this is where people oftentimes uh, receive this, this scattered uh, care. But uh, I, I bring this back because in the primary care setting is really where most people get this. And as Dr. Sen was pointing out earlier, uh, the time limitations, not even in a neurology or subspecialist office, but, you know, in the primary care office is extremely limited. And, you know, as much as we've talked about the important aspects of this today, um, those resources are, are ones that are pulled quite tight in that setting. So there's a, a huge amount of value in the identification and referral for these processes, you know, in a setting that's really more dedicated to that process itself. So, you know, again, when we think about where they enter, where do people need sub subspecialist care? Um, the, uh, in general, um, those people with infrequent migraine, um, that is the, the average person with maybe one or fewer days per month uh, of headache that, that um, may uh, in general be uh, treated with over-the-counter medications or even with a, a general prescription, they, they probably don't need to, to be referred to any higher level of care once you're confident in uh, the uh, uh, diagnosis and the management of the condition. However, once you're starting to get more frequent headaches, and this is, this is highly debated, um, you know, what about somebody starts a preventive treatment, whether that's a prescriptive preventive or non-prescriptive preventive. Uh, traditionally, we used to say, you know, four days a month, that is one headache day per week. Um, or if there's significant disability, so now we'll say two uh, severe headache days per month. But, you know, when you start to look at the longer term life uh, of somebody, you know, even if you take two severely impairing headache days per month, they, uh, now you're talking about 24 per year. And for many people, that, that, is, that is more than the sick days, more than the vacation days they may actually receive. Um, so, you know, even what seems like a relatively low number at two per month, you know, adds up significantly uh, when you're talking about uh, particularly people in, in uh, productive uh, times of, of their life. Um, so, uh, you know, early preventive treatments, very worth considering. Uh, again, um, you know, psychologic versus uh, psychiatric uh, comorbidity is very difficult to determine at times. The, uh, um, you know, one thing, uh, and again, I am trained uh, as a psychiatrist, but even myself hold true that um, if a psychiatric issue seems to be the primary issue, uh, that, that's something that, that needs to be addressed in the proper setting. Uh, even if somebody, uh, a neurologist or a headache specialist feels competency, uh, in the treatment of that, that, that that's something that, that is not best managed in, in that setting. It's best managed in the setting uh, where that can be addressed in its proper way. You know, it's a lot like medication management. Sometimes you can get a double bang for your buck, uh, but you really want to make sure you're getting the most appropriate treatment for both of those conditions. And the same uh, in terms of not even treating psychological comorbidity, but, you know, just the assessment of it and uh, in many cases, determining coping strategies and, and teaching uh, skills in that way. So uh, again, on the neurologist side, part of the key issue is determining those people who are interested in that management and, you know, actually have the, the resource and the uh, ability to participate in it because, you know, very much like like many treatments, you know, motivation uh, is, is a huge aspect to that. Uh, I know one of uh, uh, my supervisors years ago used to say that insight is a rare and expensive thing, uh, but I would say motivation also is, is the same as well. So with that, I, I, I'm gonna wrap it up, return the screen to, uh, to everybody and... Uh,
uh, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll get a chance to, to answer any questions that you all have. Excellent. And I, and uh, Dr. Seng, there is a couple questions in the chat line um, we could take. Do you want to guide this part or do you want um, me to? Ethan, would you mind? Yeah, happy to. So, um, so just going through some of the comments and we will stop at about at least two till um, to make sure uh, that uh, there's some other administrative tasks that have to get done. Um, so there was uh, one comment here um, and I'll just read it and then, and then I'll take the first response and if other people can add on to it. Um, can you comment on how the presence of other significant pain conditions are taken into account or not when addressing a design and a treatment plan for an adult or child presenting with headache? I'm thinking of the concept of chronic overlapping pain conditions as potentially centrally mediated cluster of conditions. Also, especially in children and adolescents, um, is it um, good to address this eventually in the context of treatment of headache? Um, finally, how is the presence of significant pain condition among parents addressed or not in the context of a treatment plan for children or adolescents with chronic pain? And I swear this isn't a planted question, but I actually work in a pediatric chronic pain rehabilitation program, and we see this often. Um, and so a lot of what we had addressed earlier um, uh, would still apply in terms of uh, addressing the precipitant factors, um, healthy lifestyle habits, um, uh, what, what Dr. Sang had talked about too, in terms of going to some of the third wave therapies or addressing um, anxiety and depression with cognitive behavioral therapy would be appropriate. Um, what, what I do with uh, children that I work with is we, we talk about you know, what is the chronic pain management plan, um, which does have central sensitization involved, um, and then how do you manage the episodic spikes? And so at the end of the day, for me working with a patient, it is really, um, what are you doing um, every day to get through the day? W what are you doing to manage episodic spikes? Um, it, so the action plan is, is still um, relatively similar. Uh, now, yes, we do have um, a concept, uh, a problem of parents who also have pain, have children um, who will struggle with chronic pain as well. And so that, that involves a couple of things. I mean, one is making sure that the parents are treating their chronic pain appropriately. Um, the two, the second for me anyways, is ensuring that, um, that uh, there's not uh, inadvertent secondary gain for pain symptoms, that um, the family hasn't learned an, in a maladaptive way of responding to somatic symptoms. And so oftentimes we do work on um, family therapy, family communication strategies, sometimes referring parents on for treatment for themselves. Um, those are my thoughts, but I'll uh, pass it to others. So yeah, I think that the big thing for, for me, most of my clinical experience to COPCs are in the VA, which is a very different population, right? Um, and I think that one of my biggest um, pieces of advice is that there are some ways in which the treatment of a disease that is truly episodic, like migraine often is, um, are similar to other chronic overlapping pain conditions um, related to central sensitization and like using relaxation techniques and those kinds of things. On the other hand, there's a big difference cognitively in um, a pain that you know you're likely to experience most days and trying to learn how to live with that and be active in spite of it. Um, and pain that comes on in, in episodes that's so disabling in the moment you truly can't do anything else when you get when you get an attack, and um, which is which is more like migraine. So I think that um, I I like to think about when I have people who also present with um, chronic overlapping pain conditions. I try to start with the things that I know will hit both, but I recognize that their cognitions really might be very different um, for the different kinds of disease. Um, time courses, and that, um, that that's okay, but then that gives me multiple treatment targets. Dr. Rosen, did you want to comment on that one? 
Yeah, I, I, I can uh, comment on that because it, it, it is a very common issue that drives people, again, to sub subspecialist care, um, you know, comorbid rates of back pain, um, uh, uh, GI uh, pain, uh, uh, um, and so forth uh, are, are common comorbidities that we deal with. Um, and, and actually, it's very important because sometimes people enter from uh, a pain management perspective and, and the uh, uh, interventions in that case are very different. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things we know of is the risk of uh, medication overuse and rebound uh, with uh, particularly with opiates and migraine. In fact, uh, use more than around five or six days a month of, of opiates may increase the risk of chronic daily headache. So, you know, it's not unusual to see the management of one condition have a significant effect on, on a co-occurrent one. So, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the treatment plan in these cases definitely have to take, uh, you know, uh, all of those pain conditions uh, uh, into consideration because pain is not just pain. Um, you know, uh, uh, that uh, different pains respond differently to different treatments and, um, and people, again, cognitively treat them differently as well. But, uh, um, and, and I would say, you know, these, these are also people that especially do benefit from uh, that multidisciplinary approach and uh, um, being able to, to uh, contain those different uh, uh, areas of concern as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, so here's, and there's two questions that are slightly related. So maybe we can um, link these together and still finish off with um, two minutes remaining to do the administrative piece. Um, please tell how you provide relaxation techniques. Um, uh, so we could comment on that. And then um, do we have to screen for any psychiatric conditions um, when we're doing relaxation techniques? And then the, the second question related to that was uh, about frequency of um, frequency of uh, training and, and when you might uh, pull that uh, back or, or fade treatment. Um, so, so my comments, um, for me, relaxation training, it's, it's very behavioral, it's very experiential. And so it is, I often have kids who say, yes, I learned that breathing stuff, it doesn't work. I spend a lot of time in the beginning making sure they understand the physiology um, what's supposed to change, making sure they have some sense of interoception or what's happening inside their body, and they have some sort of initial response to um, relaxation training. Um, after that, um, we can experiment with the strategy that works best for them. I do use um, a lot of apps. I have sound files that I have kids practice with after we practice in session. I almost always practice in session with them and process the exercise before and after. Um, so I know that they have an understanding of how to do it um, and that it looks like they're responding effectively. It's very helpful to just watch somebody during uh, relaxation, particularly like with breathing exercises and see if they're doing it incorrectly um, and provide that uh, appropriate feedback. Um, typically when I do treatments with individuals, I will see them weekly um, for at least um, five to six sessions. And then I will fade over time if they have demonstrated competencies and, and are starting to show some initial response to treatment. Um, I completely agree. One of my favorite tricks for teaching deep breathing, and again, I, I typically work in a room that is a traditional medical office where there's like a, a, a table for patients to lay down on and a stool that I'm, that I'm going around on. So I have my patients lay down on the table because it's much, much easier to do deep breathing when you're laying down flat on your back. And by the time I'm seeing patients, they've been breathing in a way that is less useful for a really long time. So it, it often is impossible for people to do deep breathing sitting upright at first. So um, we kind of take baby steps and I really, really kind of hammer it, hammer it home. And we will spend typically about three full sessions making sure that they're using relaxation techniques appropriately and troubleshooting how to do it in their lives. In terms of comorbidities that are potentially problematic, trauma is the classic comorbidity. So you can, you're concerned that somebody not just with PTSD, but with any history of a criterion A event could experience, have re-experiencing during a relaxation activity. 
I have to say in my clinical experience that of course that's the most kind of traumatic re-experiencing when people are re-experiencing a criterion A traumatic event. But many of my patients have re-experiencing of various types of strong emotion during relaxation. So for me, that's a side effect that you should expect and that you should prepare patients for. And the patient should be ready with grounding techniques so that they do not become overwhelmed with re-experiencing or with a flood of emotions. Well, it's now 2.58 Eastern time. And on behalf of the Society for Health Psychology, I'm Barbara Keaton, the Administrative Officer. And I wanna thank you all for attending the webinar today. Remember, if you would like CE credit for attending this event, please respond promptly to the evaluation link, which will be sent via email shortly. We will leave the evaluation open until 5 p.m. Eastern on March 31st, 2022. Then CE certificates will be sent by email within five to 10 business days after the evaluation period closes. And remember, you're encouraged to submit an evaluation even if you're not seeking credit. If you have questions or would like any follow-up information, feel free to e email us at apadivp8 at verizon.net. And we'd like to thank all our presenters for an amazing webinar. And thank you audience members for attending.